right, good morning everyone. Welcome to Chapel Grace. Good morning. Hope you're having a good morning. Enjoyed the thunder and the lightning yesterday. Display of God's power. Awesome. Well, let's pray and let's, uh, let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning and for the message. Father, we thank you so much that you are powerful and strong and in control. You're faithful and good always. And we're so thankful that through Christ we're your children and we're forgiven and we can draw near to you. And so that's what we do this morning, Lord, is we want to draw near to you. Please prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, God. We want to worship you with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength this morning. We're going to reflect and remember what Christ did, the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood for us. We pray that that communion would be sweet this morning. And as we hear your word, Lord, that we would hear it just as that, the very words of God, that they would minister to our souls, encourage us, prepare us for the good works you prepared in advance for us to do today and this week and during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Feel free to sit, stand, find your space. Let's worship this morning. <laughs>
Yeah. Oh, wow, that's loud. Can you turn me down? Of course, if uh, if you want me to wake everybody up in Kalinga, leave it up. That's just fine. It's not that late, is it? It's kind of it's like early, I mean. Not that late, not that early. It's perfect. So how is everyone today? Hello. Okay, we're going to practice talking. So start going, la, 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 talk to each other. We have some things that are going to be a little different today. We haven't done communion in a while, so we're going to do communion right now. So if you haven't gotten one of these, let us know, or you can come right up and grab them. They're up here on the table. Um, if you just got here, that's probably why you don't have one. Or uh, we just hadn't been talking about it over and over again. So make sure you grab yourself a communion cup. I'm going to give you a few minutes for that while I talk about it. Uh, communion, Lord's Supper, everybody calls it two different things, but it's the same thing. It means the same thing. Communion means coming together. Uh, and I can't think of anything more appropriate this morning than talking about coming together and doing communion. Because, you know, whether you believe one way or the other, there's been a lot of division. That can't be in the church. We just got to ignore it. We got to get rid of that. Uh, it doesn't matter. I, I forgot to take this thing off and I'm talking. Getting so used to wearing it all the time. Just because, do I believe it works? That's, that's irrelevant. It just... I just wear it. So, let's just not worry about why or what, and let's care about each other, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's the most important thing of all. So that's really kind of communion when we come down to it. Communion is an idea of like, when you look at it, you're supposed to kind of investigate or look into your own life before you take communion. You're supposed to kind of look at yourself and go, do I have any problems with anybody? Do I have any issues in my life that I haven't resolved with people or anything like that? And so, and if you do, before you take communion, you should kind of resolve those things. And so. Sometimes we try and make sure we tell you ahead of time. We didn't this week. Uh, but I've been praying for you all week. I've been praying for the message all week. I've been praying, well, not just this week. I've been praying steady. I've prayed before this. I think I pray about 60 times more, like every single second of every day right now. And uh, some good news out of Southern California with uh, John MacArthur's church. We'll see where that leads. Maybe that's going to open the doors and we can all go back inside and something can be a little different. But no matter what, Look around. We're still here. We're together. We're amongst one another. We're singing together. We're worshiping together. We're praising Jesus together. And we're about to take communion together. Amen. So let me read this to you. Well, let me pray first. So, Father, I just thank you for this morning. And I just pray that you would just minister to each and every one of us. And as I think about uh, communion and as I think about what it represents and uh, the, so, the big importance of understanding that your son, Christ, died in our place but what led up to that was so brutal and what happened on that cross and that he shed his blood and broke his body was broken for us and his blood was shed because sin is that ugly and it was needed and a holy and perfect sacrifice is all that could take care of the, the disconnect between humankind and you so god thank you for reaching out to us thank you for giving us a way to be reunited with you thank you for setting your son Jesus. And as we remember and reflect on that this morning, Father, may we take in the seriousness of it and the love that was shown through it, and may we show that same love to one another. We thank you, God, in Jesus' precious and holy and healing and communion giving name, I pray, and we all say. Amen. So I have it on 1 Corinthians. So I'm just going to read real quick for 1 Corinthians. This is one of the places that we hear about the Lord's Supper. And uh, Paul's giving this. And if you know anything about the Corinthian church, it was a messed up church. It had a lot of problems. So Paul had to kind of go through. And the first book of Corinthians is a lot of correcting, a lot of explaining that what this isn't right, that's not right. They were taking communion incorrectly. As a matter of fact, they were treating it like a regular dinner. They were getting drunk at the at communion. Uh, it was just all a crazy mess. And so Paul had to come in and he had to write a letter to them. And he had to say, look, guys, this is really bad what you're doing. Thankfully, none of us are getting drunk today. None of us are eating a meal together for the communion. Well, meeting together is good, but we're not doing that communion. And so Paul said that this, he brought out the seriousness of what it means. He said, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. That's pretty strong language, don't you think? That's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. And he says, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have, been, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. And when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. As you eat, each of you goes away, goes ahead without waiting for anyone else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk, and he keeps going on and on. He says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? And he continues on, and he says, you know what? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? And do you think he says certainly yes? He says certainly not. 
And so that's a heavy-handed message to him to a, or to a church that just was really out there. Wouldn't you agree? Anybody else see, see there's a problem here? Yeah. And so he said, so I for, for I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and he had given thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body, which, which for you, which for you do this for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So whenever you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're waiting for him to come. Right? How many people have you heard today say, I don't know how many times I've heard over and over again on a daily basis, we're, he's going to come any minute, any minute, any minute. Can you imagine what they were saying during World War II when millions of Jews were being thrown into a camp? I mean, goodness sakes, that had to be. That had to be feel like the end times, wouldn't you say? Or when you look around the world and you see the disasters that are happening and things, and we can only go, yes, the signs are showing, but we're to continue this until he comes. And remembering what he what it took. Listen, everybody, when you take this, I'm going to give you a few moments before you take it to pray. But when you take this, remember what it's it's about. It's remembering what he did. Your the the bread or the wafer is to remember his body broken, and the and the juice is. To represent the blood that he spilled and it was so crucial because those things had to happen and he was perfect and he was the only sacrifice the only way that we could be reunited with god and so as we take communion today the other part i wanted you to think about and just ask for god's guidance is if you have a problem with a brother or sister or anything like that it said there were divisions among them where there's people there's division right nobody ever agrees with one another that doesn't mean though that we treat each other with disdain or whatever so that's kind of what this is too. Just remember that when you take it, there's an there's a in, inward process that we take and we look at each other or look at, look at ourselves. I'm not, it's not my job at this moment to go, Kelly, you're a bad person. It's about looking inside ourselves and going, hey, what is it that we have going on with us and remembering what Jesus did. So um, I'm gonna pray for a little bit and I'm gonna let you guys, I want you guys to pray wherever you are. When I finish, I'm just gonna wait about 30 seconds or whatever. I don't know if God's talking to you this morning about anything at all. I, I have no idea what everybody's going through. There has to be something that people are going through right now because it would be impossible to think that everything's peachy keen because we know that's not the truth. But it may not be something as extremely serious, but it might just be something you just need to talk to God for before you take communion, just to prepare yourself. So that's what we want to do that for. So bow your heads with me and then continue until uh, I say amen. Keep your heads bowed on you. So Lord, I just thank you that we, well, first of all, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross. And I'm really thankful, God, that he didn't stay dead. Thankful that he rose from the dead three days later so that he could defend, defeat sin, death, and hell forever. But God, it's still up to us to receive that. And so those of us who have done that, those of us who received your son Jesus as Lord and Savior, we thank you for this chance to celebrate communion. When I say celebrate, Remember what it took for us to be free. Remember what it took for us to have a, a way to serve you freely and to be unified and reunited with you, God. I pray that if there's any kind of division among anyone here today uh, and, and those who are listening or watching, I pray that that would be solved, that they would be convicted in the heart just like I am many times when I know I do some, did something to someone, even... Sometimes I don't realize it and realize it later. Father, help me to make those things right. But God, today, may we focus on your son Jesus and his sacrifice for us. His sacrifice so that we could be free people. Lord, be with us as we sit here for a few moments talking to you. Reveal to us what it is that you want us to know. Prepare us for your message coming up soon too. Lord, thank you. So, Lord, it's amazing how long 30 seconds can feel. But that's not near enough time to talk to you. And, Father, I hope that everyone here is always in a state of prayer talking to you, being guided by your Spirit, 
and especially right now in this moment as we get ready to hear your word, but it's certainly as we get ready to take communion. Father, would your spirit certainly guide us? And Father, would we certainly be one together as you and Jesus are one? Thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray and we all say, and so that night, you can just, you take your cup and you open it like this. It might be a little harder for you. I've got a little table, but the top peels right off. If you haven't done this before, the top peels right off the wafer. See, look at that. It comes right off. And then the cup opens up underneath. They're two separate ones. We did that. I can't wait to get back to the right, really good bread. But we did that just for, for the, uh, you know, the whole distance stuff and all those things. But... Once you get it, let me see it so I know I'm not, I don't want to go before everybody's ready. Does everyone have communion elements? Do you, does anybody need them? Anybody at all? Does, we've got some left over there. We can get more if we need them. Okay, great. And so this wafer, this wafer is, is, represents the, blood, the body of Jesus. And his body was broken. So he said that night, take and eat and remember to be Take and eat. The funny thing about the bread is it's not supposed to be the most pleasurable experience. It's supposed to be unleavened bread, which means it doesn't have any anything in it to, uh, what's the stuff that makes it rise? Yeast. Yeast, thank you. <laughs> Completely forgot. And it's very, have you ever, anybody ever had unleavened bread before? We used to buy it all the time. At a lot of the church sites, we would go and buy it and uh, break it up and it tastes like cracker. But the point of it is, is to remind you that this is to remind you of what his body what he took for us you know jesus body was broken for us and obviously you know when your body when your skin gets broken it bleeds right and so his blood bled for us and it washed our sins it made us white as snow before god his, it was required blood was always required sacrifice and so jesus was our sacrifice so he said that he, so paul said take and drink in remembrance of me take and drink in jesus name.
That's it right there. Okay, I want to make sure. So, again, I'm going to ask you one more time since I got you woken up now and you've had communion, you've had time to do that. How is everybody today? Everybody doing good? Is anybody else sweating yet? Just me? I remembered my bright blaze orange Kalinga horn toads. Sweat rag, whatever you call this thing. I don't know what you call it, but that's what I call it. So I'm going to use it the whole time. So hopefully uh, won't distract you too bad. So, you know, it's going to be hot today. That's what they're saying. going to be hot for the next several days. But all we know is that our God is good. Amen. And uh, thankfully, he's given some of us air conditioning. Thank you so much. If he hasn't, then um, I don't know. I guess you could just like sit out. Hopefully you have a pool then or something. You can go sit out in water for the whole time. It's joking. I don't mean that. I'm just kidding around. But uh, I'll get you guys yet. You'll figure it out. I want to welcome you to Chapel Grace. In case, case I know that I've met a couple people here today that's kind of their first time. I want to thank you for being here today. It's really, really awesome. Um, we've been going through the Book of Acts. Normally we have gifts to give away to our first time visitors. Just remind me if you're still, you know, if we're still around, you know, Jesus doesn't return before we all get to go back inside. We'll make sure we get you one of those gifts. I'm not sure they're inside, right, Kelly? You could get them if you want to and have them out here later. Uh, which is just our way of saying thank you for coming and also uh, so we, if you want to we can follow up with you and kind of see what your needs are those kind of things same goes for everybody that's already going here I need to know what your needs are so I can be there and pray for you and we can help you today is kind of that, about that message it's a little different it's not as much about well it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with COVID and none of them do actually today has everything to do with serving one another which I've discovered that what we're doing as far as like the needs of people a lot of people had just assumed that hey everything's much easier because we're not you know we're not in, indoors or whatever it was and that's it couldn't be further from the case there's a lot of needs out there that people have there's a lot of things going on if anything emotional needs are the biggest thing going on right now people are just they're they're scared they're confused they're mad they're you name just about every emotion in the book and it's out there and the church is no different we're the same as the rest of the world you know when it goes to like being you know emotional and having things going on around us I think we'd be lying to ourselves if some of this stuff didn't didn't concern us or if you still feel sometimes you feel apprehensive around a big group of people and that's not normally you uh, I know that God created us as people to be around each other as, as a kind of we like to commune with each other we like to be with each other we're very relational and that's that's the way God created us because God is relational with us and that's the difference between uh, religion in a relationship religion is just something that you do to appease somebody else relationship is you know that person you get to know them and you get to find out who they are and God loves you God knows all about you it's our turn our turn to find out all about him and the only way to find all about him is to know him more and more and more every day and you know him through Jesus and so once we get to know him though once people receive him then there then that presents another problem now they want to grow and they want to learn and then there's some needs that come up when people start coming together which is exactly what happened in the early church people were coming in i don't know if the correct terminology is right but in droves they were just the, the message was so attractive the idea of coming together and being there for one another not in judgment but in in a, in a way of being there for one another and understanding and hearing that the messiah had come in jesus and that they could all come together and they could all be one together and they could provide the needs for one another and things started growing and people started coming and that's where we start off so we're going to be in acts chapter 6 today and acts chapter 6 presents kind of a new problem that they hadn't addressed yet and it also presents a problem that we have in our world today as to where people don't get along because they're different types of people we have two different kinds of jews in this that's coming out we're going to have the grecian jews and the Hebra hebraic jews i mean i've said that right and i'll explain those in just a minute and it, and it cost tension inside of the group of people together as i as i said just get two different people in a room and there'll be disagreements amen that's right because we're all not the same people but that doesn't mean we don't just because there's disagreements doesn't mean there's there should be hatred or any kind of thing like that right disagreements are okay fred you just remind me you took your mask off if you guys feel like overheated take your mask off please i have to take mine off uh, all the time it's not meant if you can't if you can't breathe through it whatever don't don't sacrifice yourself that way and make it worse for yourself uh you know what i mean if you've ever felt that you know what i'm talking about so open your bibles to acts chapter six starting in verse one and um in case you guys most of you know me some of you may not and this is kind of also for the video i'm pastor bruce and that's pastor jared and our praise team and maybe he'll introduce them there at the end I don't, are you guys where are you jared i always lose you oh way back in the back 
Are you guys coming back up for another song or no, not today? Well, anyway, that was our praise team. Uh, they're wonderful. Yes, we are. And uh, I have to admit we're blessed. We truly are blessed. We've got some great people, so, and some great singers and some great play, uh, musicians, and we even don't have all of them here today. Some of them are missing. So anyway, I'm just giving you an opportunity to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. We're only going to be going to verse 8, because next week we're going to pick up, because some serious stuff comes down the pipe, and then through we're going to start being introduced to a guy named Paul, who is the guy who just wrote 1 Corinthians. Earlier I had said that Paul said, it was actually Jesus who instituted communion, not Paul. Paul was just reiterating it. Jesus actually started it that night, uh, the night before he was you know, taken in custody or whatever you want to say, or you know, taken to be beaten and ultimately sacrificed for us on the cross. So verse 6, chapter 1, I'm reading from the NIV. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews or Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now that was a very important part of they were commanded to take care of widows. And so it was something that was ingrained in their society of who they were. It's extremely important. And it didn't matter if you were a different, you know, from a different region, taking care of one another, taking care of those who needed being taken care of has always been a part of the church. It was a part of the Jewish faith and it, it's always changed right over. By the way, we're not, we're not Jews by, by birth or anything like that. But we've accepted Jesus, and so that makes us followers of Jesus. But a lot of things that continued over, and we still follow. People talk about the Old Testament and how, hey, we don't follow that. Yes, we do. There's still things in the Old Testament that are extremely important. And this is one of them, taking care of other people, taking care of those who can't take care of themselves, like, uh, excuse me, pardon me, uh, like uh, widows. And I would almost include, like, single moms into that, because single moms need help, too. And... You know, and all those kind of things too. Not that they're incapable, because there's very st most single moms I know are extremely strong. But uh, there's nothing more strong than knowing when you need to reach out for help and asking for it. There's nothing. Sh there's nothing wrong with that. But anyway, when people need help, we're supposed to be there for one another, and that's what happens here. Is the numbers were increasing, and it brought something. It brought a problem ahead. But as I was telling you, when you get two different people in a room, there's always a problem, right? There's always disagreements. Not so, it doesn't need to be a problem, but it becomes a disagreement. And that's what happens here. A big disagreement. We'll talk about that some more here in a minute. And the difference between the two different kind of Jews. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together. That would be the first original twelve apostles. And all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers, and, and uh, some, some versions say brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Uh, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, Prochorus, uh, terrible with saying like those kind of things, Nicanor, Timon, that's not Timon, that's not like that guy from, uh, was it Lion King? Or Lion, yeah, Lion King. Uh, par, par, Arminius and Nicholas, thank you for a really easy one, from Antioch and a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the, to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. That's pretty amazing. And then verse 8, I'm just going to include this. We're not going to talk about it a ton today. Now a man, Stephen, who we know is just appointed to help, man full of God's grace and power did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people and we're going to stop there because next week we're going to get into Stephen and what happens with him and so here we have it we have a group of people that have come together the church is forming the church is brand new and it is growing like like wildfire it's just no pun, no pun intended but we know what wildfire does right Colleen knows it all too well she's how many seasons have you seen it now just about every one almost I think and it goes and it goes and it goes and so when something's attractive, wildfire's not attractive, you run from that. This is something that people were running to. The church was something that was just brand new, and it, I want to switch over here, and it was something that was so important that people needed it. They recognized it was going to fill a need, something that they hadn't felt before, because here's the thing. Following God was never supposed to be the kind of thing where you feel like it's cumbersome. It was supposed to be, we were always supposed to be there for one another, but things had become a little different in some areas, and had become a little bit more burdensome on, common, on top of people. They started bringing the law and making it burdensome and creating some problems.
But then, so now we, we fast forward and we see that these people have come together and we see that needs are coming up. You know, when the church grows, there's needs. I'm looking out here, we have grown in numbers. We started out with, uh, I mean, I'm talking about after, after, you know, we all got back together. We were starting out with, what, 35, 40 people, I don't know. And now look at everybody out here. It's so good to see all your faces. It's so good to see, I can actually see your faces. Some of you have your mask off so I can see you smiling. I've gotten really good at seeing when someone smiles because their eyes move like right here, so you can tell they're smiling under the mask. You really got to look. But uh, it's, uh, it's good to see one another, and it's good to be with each other. But sometimes problems arise, amen? With people come more needs. Uh, and so that brings the need to help. That brings a need that needs to be fulfilled, and it's not just always possible just with pastors. This is what we can liken to what the apostles were doing. They were The, the, the uh, pastors kind of fill that role now. We're not apostles, but we're pastors, and we're led to lead, but uh, and to lead the uh, the group of people, our flock, which so to speak, is what it's called. But with that, though, is when churches grow, there's absolutely no way that I could meet the need of every single person in Chapel Grace on my own. Nor could Jared, with me. That's just two of us, and so that means that we need help. So most churches are made up with more than they don't function unless there's people helping to make things happen. Do you guys understand that? Is that new to anybody? You guys should all be just going, this is old hat. Why are you talking about this? Because nope, not if everybody were giving and everybody were serving, I mean, giving is serving, by the way. It's part of our service to God. I mean, part of our giving to God. Then we would never have the holes and needs that we have. We're getting ready to start up a new children's ministry. Not new. It's going to be an extension of what we already had, but we can't do it inside. So we're going to be doing it here after this service. Coming up, uh, I forgot, September 13th. Hopefully it'll be a little cooler by then, too. Uh, and as long as we're still outside... We're still outside we want to find a way to meet the families that have children so they can bring their families out here and it can be in a, in, a, in a kind of style where families can worship together and they can learn together and then we're going to give them opportunities to go beyond that moment and be able to take it to another level at home and have something that goes throughout the week with them and then we're also talking about how we're going to make a want to work all of those things right now but with that comes help we need help badly right there's absolutely no way i could be in charge of all of those things and make them work well that's why when we do Awana, we have Awana commanders, we have uh, uh, leaders in each Awana, and then we have people that are in charge of different ministries. The people in charge of those ministries, you could almost call them like the deacons. They're not all deacons, but they do deacon type of ministry. And they're leaders. They're mature people. And so what happens is we have this coming through, and we need to serve in the church because without other people serving other people, the church couldn't grow and we couldn't meet each other's needs. Everybody say, I understand if you understand. All right, cool. Some of you didn't, that's why we're going to talk here in a minute. We're going to do something a little different too as soon as I can. I'm going to have you guys maybe turn around or in families or however you feel comfortable and we're going to do some discussions and talk about the message a little bit to wrap it up and then I'll bring us up and wrap it up together. Trying to think of things to make it a little different because things have been weird lately. And I think we've all been a little disconnected from one another. And I think this is a way to connect us to each other and be able to look at each other's face rather than just you all looking at me all the whole time and then going home. So with numbers come problems and we also have the strife here. I think the best way things work, people get along better if they can work it out and they work it out together. It's not always easy for you just to come to the pastor and say, Pastor, make this right. Because what I'll do is tell you, well, let's get the other person and we're going to have to talk together if there's a problem with somebody. And so talking about that other person never helps, does it? But going together, when we know that there's issues, we should approach them and, and fix them. Here's exactly what happened in the beginning of this. I'm going to get some more on about serving. But what happened here is the, how, this brought up a, an issue that needed to be fixed. The Hellenistic Jews... And the Hebraic Jews were two different groups of people, but they were still they were also Jews and they were all converted Jews in this case. One was one group of people uh, were those who were born in Jerusalem. That would be the ones who are the Hebrew Jews. I'll just say it like that. That's just easier to say. And they came together and there was a difference of opinion and they got mad at each other because the Grecian Jews will say those are the ones who were born outside of Jerusalem. Those are the ones that are still Jewish. But they were born outside of Jerusalem, and they were just—they had a different set of ideals, I guess. They had a different culture going on. Some people would call them uh, uh, Hellenistic Jews, which is just means that they were—they weren't anything. They weren't worse. They were just in a different, born in a different area, and were worshiping Jesus in a different area, doing things in a different spot, maybe in like Greece or whatever. Um, and so, and so they, and they, by the way, they mostly spoke Greek. They didn't speak Hebrew. And so that was another difference. You have a language difference between the two people. And if anybody knows anything about language differences, people in Kalinga do, don't we? We know that the, there's a huge difference between, you know, I, I'm starting to pick up Spanish after 14 years a little bit. 
And, I, and even when I say it, they everybody laughs at me, so I don't talk it very often. I just kind of understand it more, but muy poco, right? I don't even know what that means. I just said it weird. <laughs> so I know donde es baño. That's about the best one I could ever know. And see, I don't even say that right. I always get teased about that. So I just say, where's, this, where's the bathroom? Or point to it, or baño. But we're, when, when cultures and differences come, when differences come, it creates something, doesn't it? And that's what happened here. You had a difference of people maybe kind of thinking, hey, you're showing preferential treatment to this group of people more than this group of people. And rather than causing a big, huge distraction, they said, this is, let's fix this. Rather than go, hey, you know what? That's not true. And they argued about it, right? That never fixes anything, does it? When someone brings something up and you argue about it, it never fixes it. You should discuss it as rational people and seek a way to fix it. And so instead of the apostles going, hey, you guys are crazy. Everything's fine. They said, look, we need help. This is obviously presenting a problem that we need to fix. And as church family, we should always be looking at that together and saying, what are the issues? What do we need to make things keep going? And what can we fix, right? We should never go, hey, it never helps to grumble behind the pastor or anybody else or any leaders. We need to know what's happening so we can fix it. Otherwise, we can't fix things. We can't make things right. And that's exactly what happened here. They said, we're going to fix this. And I think if our country could grab a hold of this concept right now, I think the divisions that are out there right now could be solved too, as long as we could look at each other and talk in a rational way. Instead of accusing and blaming each other, because blame only brings, uh, you know, lost my word there. Uh, blame, blame only makes you more angry, right? It kind of makes you contentious. We start blaming each other rather than seeking, seeking a way to fix it. So that's what they did. And they said, we need to get help. And so this is where the idea of deacons came. This is the beginning of like a deacon ministry. And deacons, you're probably going, what does that mean? Most churches have deacons. Most of them call them deacons. They call them a deacon ministry. They'll call them a deacon board. They'll call them a deacon, deacon council. But the point is, they're there. And they're always... They're not usually paid people. They're not usually people who are on staff as pastors. You're usually people, just like everybody here, working, and then they come and they serve in the church, and they're leaders in the church. And so they recognized that there was a need here. And instead of going, hey, you know what, whatever, they made the proposal, and they made a decision. And they went after it, and they fixed it. They suggested that men full of faith, full of spirit and wisdom be chosen. Now, so why should we serve in church? You're going, to, you're going to answer some of those questions because you guys have already got the questions in your hand, the so what questions. Um, and so here's the idea, though. When you're, when you're a leader in a church, we don't just need all leaders because everybody can't be a leader. We need people that can serve, too, underneath the leadership of other people. But a leader in a church, say a deacon or a pastor or somebody else that's in leadership, needs to be fully mature. It can't be a brand new believer because how can they lead other people if they don't know anything about what's to happen themselves? Does that make sense to anybody else but me? Yes, Good. Does. It makes complete sense. And so everyone can serve, but not everybody should be in leadership in the church at first. Does that make any sense at all too, right? So if you're brand new, like, like a job, let's just put it out there. Well, I've been on jobs where they said, just go figure it out. And you're lost. You're like, I, I don't think I stayed at those jobs very long. I was like, uh, see ya. Because, you know, it, you got to be taught and trained how to do something. And same thing is true in ministry. I've been doing ministry now for how long, Kelly? Since I was 18, so I don't want to tell you how old I am. Yeah, I don't care. I'm 51. So you guys do the math because that's why I'm not a teacher. So, but I've been doing ministry for a long time, and I've been surrendered to the ministry since I was about 21-ish, something like that, or 22. And then I went to Bible college, and so I've done some training, and I've learned. But the most way I've learned about how to serve Jesus and how to more about the Bible is doing and being. Surrendering and following and ministering and volunteering in church and learning and being a part of Bible studies and different ministries. It's how I grew. I grew way more than I ever doing that than I ever have reading a book. I, I went through four years of four years of Bible college and I went through however many years it felt like forever for a master's degree, my master's of divinity. And there's a lot of good information there. There's a lot of good stuff, but it's really meant to help me learn about be more of a, a better believer for myself and be able to teach it to other people. Because being relational is more important than understanding what a book says. Because a book doesn't come out the real value. Does anyone else agree with that? Yeah. Real life training is where you learn. It's where you get a hold. It's where you start to understand that if people, if you feel lost, like I don't know what my place is in church or in ministry, we need to get involved. Find a place. If, you, if that doesn't work, then go to a different spot that you can serve in. We've got, we're starting, I just finally, we, not I, we have finally just said, you know, not finally, but we're going to go with, we're just going to use what we, we're going to do what we can with what we've been given. We're allowed to serve, we're allowed to help, we're allowed to do. 
we have ministries that we need to keep going, we have discipleship that we need to have happen, and all of those things. And so we have different places. We have things that need to be set up on Sunday mornings. We could use help with all of those things. And those are the places that you start. I started doing all of that. And so once we get involved, so everyone can serve. Anyone can serve, including children. Even Jared's kids can lead other kids. I'm looking at him back there. Any kids can serve. Young adults can serve. Teenagers can serve. Adults can serve. Any, everyone should be able and can serve. But they can't all be leaders. But I've seen some phenomenal teen leaders. Because of being a youth pastor, man, and they're so amazing and so driven and so out there and just ready to go. And they, and they get developed and they're ready to learn and they're eager to learn. And they become some of the greatest leaders. And some of them are out there all around the different places. Thinking of Johnny DeFosis. Well, you probably wouldn't want me to call him Johnny. He's John. I'm John now, right? But he came up through our ministry. He was part of our lives, part of my life for a long, well, actually the whole time I was here. I remember when he was like that, he was really annoying. And then he was like that, and he was still annoying. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I love Johnny to death. Johnny's probably one of my favorite people in the world. I have a lot of kids that I love. Colleen's kids were were and are amazing. Johnny's amazing. So I can keep going. Darren, people that I saw grow. And the point is, though, they developed as teenagers in high school leading, and now they're where they are, and they're in different places in their lives, and they're leaders where they are. Johnny, for instance, for, for instance, is in a church, started to help start a church, and now he's still serving a church. So you don't you don't just jump out and start running. You have to get involved somewhere to learn. Make sense? All right, I've got to give us some time so you guys can have talks, so I don't want to go too far. All right, so why should we serve in church? Because it's important for us all to be able to grow. It's important for us all to be able to be a part of each other and meet the needs. And then do you think it's important for a deacon or leader to be mature? Absolutely. Because why do you think it's important for someone to be mature to lead or to be a deacon? A deacon is somebody who will meet the spiritual needs of people and serve tables and do those things along with the pastor. They have the same qualifications almost as a pastor, in fact. It's important to be mature so you know how to make those decisions so when things come, you can be able to help somebody else. If you're brand new and you've never you know, come across those things, it's pretty hard to help somebody in a deeper way, but you can still certainly help people even if you're brand new. So don't let me discourage you from that. But being mature and being wise is important because it brings you to a place that God's got you there. And it's important that people recognize that about you too. That's what they said here. Pick people among you who are known to be wise, full of the Holy Spirit. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? First of all, you're spirit-led. And you're a believer, right? And so we've got this idea of like, why is it important? We need to be mature and led by the Spirit. So the Spirit is the one that guides us, not our feelings. Feelings and emotions will always drive us to the wrong place. And um, I'm going to open my Bible over here. And to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy is where we see the demonstrator, or the 1 Timothy 3, I think it is, is where we see, um, I can't get my, my, my fingers to work. Sorry. I'm in 2 Timothy. That's why I can't find it. So there is two Timothys, first and second. Those go second three, second Timothy three. You won't find what I'm looking for. Overseers and deacons is the head title. This is where you find out the qualifications of a pastor and a deacon or a servant in the church, at least a leader in the church. So we're just going to start with this, and we're just going to talk about deacons in verse eight. They're supposed. To, it says likewise here because they have almost identical qualifications of a pastor. And it says likewise deacon, deacons likewise are to be in First Timothy three eight are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must be first tested, and then if there's nothing against them, they, they can let them serve as deacons. In the same way, let their wives, in the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must be his aid, his, must manage his children and his household well, and those who have served well again, an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So he's, he, that's, pretty, that's pretty big standards, don't you guys think? For someone to stand and be in a leadership in that kind of area, that means that you have to have a little bit of ability that's above and beyond the normal, just everybody who had just received Christ. And sometimes people are still in that area of being immature because they haven't served and they haven't done anything to grow in their faith. When you grow in your faith, not only just by reading, as I've already said, but also serving. As a matter of fact, serving will get you to the next level. It'll cause you to reach out. It'll cause you to study. It'll cause you to get deeper in the word. Because when someone asks you a question about the Bible and you go, uh, 
hold on, I don't know. You'll find out. And that's how we grow and that's how we're challenged too because I don't know everything about the Bible. I know that surprises you, right? But I don't know everything about the Bible either. And I think that uh, it's important that we always are learners. Don't be a know-it-all. And that's what I try not to be. But that means we also need people who can serve and help in the church as well. And so that's importance of serving. And so I think it's important that you also see that the reference to the apostles of the 12 occurs here. But it also, it, when it refers to the people serving, it's a pattern that's set for both lay leaders and clergy pastors. And God's work will move and more be more efficient if it's careful, followed carefully. So we do, in, do by doing this, we can be efficient, we can be helpful, and ministry can go. Now, they, they have made a... a a proposal to bring everybody in, right? You remember we read that, and they said, pick people who, who are among you, who are respected, who are known to be men, and I'm going to say men and women, because we obviously know not just men serve in church, right? Women serve too. Women have a lot of roles, a lot of leadership roles as well. And so, but we know that there's importance, of, because there's things that happen, and they find themselves responsible for things that other people wouldn't find themselves responsible for. Let's use finance for an, for an instance. Finance has tripped so many people up in so many ways so often throughout ministry that it's become a, a thing that you have to be able to find out about that person and they need to be respected and, re and trustworthy and responsible to be able to handle that. Because when, you, when you're handling other people's money, you definitely want to respect and, and trust that they can do that, right? Would you want somebody that's handling our money to be respected and trusted, right? And so that's why that's important. But then you also continue in so many areas of ministry to where if we're going to meet each other's needs and it's going to be a higher need, we need to be able to take care of that. And so that's why this is so important. So when they made that, that proposal, the church, uh, it was the community of God's spirit made the decision together. That's why when we choose, and matter of fact, we, could, we need deacons desperately. So if that's a role that you're looking into, you'd like to look into, we could use you. And we definitely have our, our board elections coming up, our new board stuff coming up for January. So we need to get that out there. So if you're praying about being in leadership in that high level of leadership, not just a serving leadership, but where you're going to be making decisions uh, that impact the entirety of the church, we could use you right now. So anyway, let's get back to this for just a minute. All seven men that were uh, pro proposed, all seven people had Greek names. But one of them singled out as having been a Gentile convert to Judaism, and that's the very last guy. So they did that on purpose. I think they chose because they knew that they needed to bring people together in a, con in a, in a way that would not cause more corruption. Can you imagine or, or upset because they recognized that the people, that the, the Grecian Jews were upset? And it would be almost like in your face, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and choose people to serve that are all Jewish names and all Jewish people, strictly Jewish, and have always been, you know, Jerusalem Jews, I guess we'll say. Can you imagine what that would have done? What would, how would you, let me just ask you a second, how would you feel? Just think about it for a minute. Would you feel like you're being listened to? Probably not. So it's important. We do need to take everyone into consideration. Every person, every feeling, every difference of opinion, and look at it for real. And so that, I think that's what's happening here. And I, I, it just seems like that's just something that's wise that we should all do. So I'm kind of going on here, on and on and on. So the word diakonos or deacon is, is the word dia, I always have diakone or diakono. And it literally means to serve, distribution. And so it's something that came later that Paul actually coined the term and actually made the more of the qualifications. This is just where it started, I, where the uh, action started. And so it's, it's extremely important in faith to have people who serve. Amen? If we didn't serve one another, how could we continue as a church? I know this is way different than a normal message, but it's extremely important, especially in today's times. We need to be able to serve one another. Amen, Lori? What were you just telling me last week? We need deacons. We need disciplers. Amen? We need people. But we need people who want to serve, and we need people who love Jesus, and we need people who just want to be there for one another. That's what we need. Not because you want to have the pat on the back of the outer boys, or you want to, hey, look, that's deaconess or deacon whoever. So anyway, so who can serve, who can lead, can, treat, can kids? Do you think? And so they pick these people, they pick them on purpose, and then what happens after that is pretty incredible, is that they laid hands on them. And they prayed over them, recognizing the importance of what they were about to do. And so because of that, I started thinking back to myself, how many times do we lay hands on new deacons? Where's David? I lost him. Way back there. So, David, we need to start praying more of our deacons on a regular basis and our leaders. 
when you lay hands on somebody, it was a show. It was a show of the seriousness of it. It was a show that you know that they've been chosen and that, they, and that you want them to be blessed. So our leaders should be prayed over. Because it, let me tell you, once you step out of leadership, there's a big target. You're not just every, every, every ordinary Joe anymore. Now people, there's a target on you, not just from people, but from the enemy. He's now recognized you as more of, of, a, uh, of, of a challenge than you were before. Not that you weren't before, because he always, Satan, let me remind you of this, Satan hates us. <laughs> He's not a good guy. He has not, he does not have our best interest at heart and he wants to take us down. That increases extra, I don't know, tenfold when you start serving in church because now you have all these other responsibilities, not just your own and your family. Now you have people under you that you need to take care of. That's the, another importance of why we need to be prayed over and also why we need to be wise and led by the spirit if we're going to be leaders. So it's important to pray over our leaders and then serving, you can serve well. <laughs> or you can serve poor. One of the things they used was the word responsibility. When you serve, you have a responsibility to serve. When you give and you, and you surrender, that means you're called to be responsible for something and not just flaky and say, I don't feel like it today. And that's been something that can be difficult for most people. It's not, it, it doesn't mean that you can't miss a Sunday here and there. It doesn't mean that you can't go on vacation. It doesn't mean any of those things, but what it does mean is dedication. And that's something that's important. Being dedicated to what you're doing is extremely important. So let me go on. So uh, it can help us in several ways. It can help us to grow numerically, which is, which is okay, it's good. Numerically is a good thing, but I'm more encouraged or more uh, concerned about the spiritual growth than I am even numerical growth. I, I get more concerned about that, and that's why we've talked about discipleship. That's why we've talked about ways to help people grow. That's why we wanna try and get small groups going. That's all of those things so we can grow, right, Henry? That's right. We need to be able to grow, and so it can certainly help when we, when we serve and help each other, okay? And so, let me see here. Where was I at? That's my place. So we're going to talk about that. I just want you guys to kind of talk about that together. And then there's one bigger thing, though, that may be kind of important here. And I, and I, and I think Paul, I think uh, Luke included it here. By the way, Luke was not a, uh, he was a Greek. He was not a Jew. The one who wrote this book. He included at the very end that people, certain kind of people were coming to the faith. Do you guys remember what it said? The word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Why do you think that's important? These are the religious leaders, the ones who were going in the temples and the ones that were offering sacrifices. The ones who probably understood the whole idea of sacrifice in the temple more than many people. And it says, large numbers of priests became obedient to the faith. That's almost equivalent to people in leadership today that are in other things, doing other things that we might look at and go, wow. Do you think that, I can't think of anybody, uh, think of somebody that recently or has come to Christ that was like a very popular person or maybe a person in politics or maybe a person in some kind of business or something and nobody ever thought they would come to Christ. Um, Getting, he just said he wanted to run for president, Courtney. What's his name? Kanye. Kanye. Thank you. Why did I forget Kanye West's name? That's crazy, right? He came out for a long time. He was a guy who said, you know, I almost look at him as like almost like Paul. He was a guy who called himself like the Messiah. He had his own Bible. Seriously. And he was having people follow him in that sort of way. You remember when I saw that, Courtney? What I was like, I was like, stay away from that guy. That's evil, right? And, I, and I'm like, thinking about and so many people so many young people and older people listen to Kanye and then recently he came to Christ and he wrote a gospel song and, and all of those things and and even I doubt it like is this real is this real but let me tell you the things he's been saying the way he's been acting it's real to me it seems like it is anyway now you he's kind of his other antics I'm not going to go to those but it seems like he really does love Jesus because he was starting to go out and preach Jesus and going to prisons and finding all kinds of opposition but that's I'm trying to say that it might be somebody like him that you would look at and go, whoa, that guy came to Christ. Can you imagine if, I, don't even, I can't even think of anybody's name right at the top of my head, uh, but somebody that would all of a sudden say, hey, yeah, I've completely given my life over to Jesus and, and did a, a complete 180 where they were completely against Jesus. That's the kind of idea what we're looking at here. These guys weren't necessarily against Christ. They weren't definitely weren't against the Messiah because they were looking for Messiah. 
but they were definitely had to think hard and they knew the Bible and they were practicing the faith. They became obedient to the faith, which means they received Jesus Christ and fully accepted that he was Messiah and fully accepted that they were going to follow through with everything and, that, and understanding that it didn't abolish the Old Testament, it fulfilled the law. The law is not gone. It just fulfilled that part of it were sacrifices, which is the part that they took part in, was fulfilled and they recognized that. You see, Jesus came and died for us on the cross, not so that we could just go to church, and not so that we could just have a Bible, and not so that we could just pray, and not so that we could just do. He came so we could be reunited, so we could be right, made right before God. First and foremost, He died on the cross and rose to the dead because here's the thing: He is God. And when He died on the cross, He was the only person that could do that because all people. Jews or not, recognize that only a perfect person could die for someone. And the only perfect person, the only perfect being is God. And so God himself, clothed in flesh, was placed on a cross, died horrifically, fulfilled all the scripture that, that went along with it. And these priests recognized that. And that's why Jesus died for us. And so I want to give you guys... An opportunity. He died for us so that we could be made right with God, but we still have to make that decision. We still have to choose. We have to say, we have to receive it. We have to understand it. We have to hear it, then receive it. It's just like any gift. You don't get it. You don't have it until you take it. You have to receive Jesus. And at that point, you're immediately qualified to serve. And then you can start growing. And who knows, then anything's possible. We're going to talk about what that anything is possible next week, okay? So I'd like you guys to take a few minutes. Does anybody have the time? I forgot to put my watch on here. Nine, oh, what? Dag, now that I went too long. So you guys got 10 minutes, and I want you to talk to each other about these questions real quick. You can either talk amongst your family, if you don't feel comfortable talking to other people, if you don't want to spin around, whatever. But just take a few minutes, just look over this, bring this home with you, and continue the discussion at home. But I'm going to go sit with my wife and my family and talk about it, and then we'll get back together, and then we'll finish. Sound good? Everybody okay? You live out there? Or did I bore you to death? Okay, good. All right, so go ahead and talk for a few minutes. Hello, everybody. Hey, did you guys enjoy getting to talk about it at least together? I think it's refreshing. I think it's a chance for us to learn together. I know it wasn't quite enough to, it wasn't quite enough to get through it all and to study it all. Because the idea behind it was for everybody to understand, hey, look, you know, we can learn together, right? And so I wrote some things down. The thing about all of this is this is how we complete the mission of Christ. And serving one another and coming together and learning and growing and hearing these things. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm probably going to do it a lot more often. It's kind of the how we're going to do children's ministry next after, you know, when we start that in September. If we're not back inside, even then it'll still be kind of that way. But it's important to be able to put this to practice. Listening to it, in my opinion, isn't enough. And so that's kind of what it comes down to. And so some of the things, you got to get what I was trying to get to with questions. Who can serve? Obviously, everyone can serve. Yeah. And everyone should serve. And Courtney, she's a reason I forgot to say about the whole, and I say this all the time, mission is important. And it's what fulfills the mission. The only way we fulfill the mission is by all of us serving. And so, you know, we've got all these things happening. I'm not going to rehash them all. But I want to say, there's one thing that really kind of hit me as we were talking and the Spirit spoke to me, is that... This is it. Everyone thinks you have to be perfect to start serving. That's not true. You're made perfect in Christ the moment you receive him. You're made perfect before God as far as because that's not your action. That's not something you do. That's something that's done by the blood, by the death, burial, and resurrection and sacrifice of Jesus. He made you perfect in God's eyes. What I mean by that is he makes it so you can approach God now because before Jesus... You're a sinner, and God is holy and can't be around sin. But the moment you receive Jesus, he covers you. His blood covers that, and it makes you white as snow, and that's how you can approach God. And so make no mistake about it. This is not, that was supposed to be a fun. We all will make mistakes. We all will all not be perfect. But as we grow together and encourage one another together, that's how the church grows stronger. That's how the mission is accomplished, and that's how you learn more about yourself, and we learn more about one another. Amen? This is one of those ones I'm following along with Acts, in the book of Acts. And I'm like, how am I going to preach that? That's, you know, but I, I thought it was just important that we all know that serving is one of those things that's not just for 
one sort of purse that's for everybody. And so all of us have an area that you've been gifted in, that we've been gifted in. All of us have the ability to do something and whatever that is. I, I could start naming names off, but I'll leave somebody, I'll leave a lot of people out. And there's absolutely no way we can accomplish the mission of Christ or the mission of Chapel Grace without all of us serving one another in one form or another. Amen? Some of us are called to serve a little bit deeper. Some of us are called to be those deacons. Some of us are called to be on some of those, those, uh, those more complicated, harder boards because those really take some wisdom and some time together and some discernment. But all of us have the ability to serve. All of us have the ability to do something for one another. All of us have the ability to fulfill a need in the church. All of us do. And so that's what I want to encourage you with. I want to leave you with that. So if you don't mind, I'm going to pray and close this out. We went a little longer today because Pastor Bruce is a little long-winded. Uh, and this was actually a lot longer than it, I could have been. I could have gone for another hour talking about this because serving is one of my passions. And uh, I love people. I love serving. And uh, we all get frustrated in service too sometimes. So we have to be careful and be able to take those breaks too. But serving people is one of the greatest things that we've been gifted to be able to do ever, I think. And it's how we follow and pursue. And Jesus said he came to be a servant. And how are we any better than Jesus? We're not. Jesus is the greatest. And his example was to serve. So bow your heads with me, please. God, I, uh, it's not about performances or anything like that when we come to sing together, when we, when we hear the word of God preached. It's about your spirit. It's about you, God, speaking to us through your spirit. And so, Lord, I pray that somehow, some way, even in my jumbled mix of words and, and things that maybe I said, God, that you spoke. And you, you kind of showed somebody, hey, they can serve. They are fully capable. So, Lord, you called us all to be in ministry. You called us all to do something. You called us all, every one of us, to reach out to others for your son, Jesus Christ. There's not one person that's left out of that mandate. There's not one person that's not been called to spread the gospel. But all of us are in different areas in our life and different have different experiences that we can serve the church with. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of everyone here and show them, show everyone what it is that you have for them. Show them what you've gifted them with. Let them find out from others if that's what it needs to happen. But God, show us all that we can serve and serve well. Lord, help us to know that none of us are perfect, but help us to know that you're there for us always. And God, right now, thank you for that breeze blowing on my back. Lord, I love you so much. I pray that you minister to each and every one of us. And before I close this morning, Father, I want to pray for Geronimo and his family. As uh, Geronimo has been diagnosed with COVID-19. So, Father, I pray for him. And he's compromised. He's got all kinds of things happening with his health. So, God, protect him and give them to the, meet their needs. And one thing, Father, that we can do to meet needs is to give and to help. So I pray for Geronimo and his family right now. And so many others. There's other people that we know that we know personally that have had it. Our family in Virginia has, been, has had someone, has lost someone from COVID-19. And now uh, other things are happening in our family. Father, may we always be looking for ways to serve and help other people. But God, may we always think about people like Geronimo. May we continue to pray for him. And thank you for the good news that we heard recently about Mimi. And she's cancer-free. Thank you, God, for that news. That's a great thing. So, Lord, you healed her. And she gets to go back and kind of go back to somewhat of a normal life here very soon. So, God, we rejoice with her with that. We rejoice and thank you for that, God. And we pray the same for others who are not feeling well, that you would heal their bodies. God, you are the great miracle maker, miracle worker. Father, may we always look to you for everything. May we always follow you in prayer. In Jesus' precious and holy and healing name I pray and we all say amen. When we do uh, communion, we always have the uh, diaconate offering or the, um, anyway, it's an offering that we used to help people in need. Like Geronimo's family has a need for their car. Their car is broken and he needs to get the dialysis and really can't have anybody else taking him. He has COVID. So, you know, we can't really, he needs help with that. So that's what that fund goes to. So we always take a little bit extra. So if you can give a little bit extra and, and it could go to the diaconate fund so we can assist and help other people, that would be great. I want to thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the discussion together. I hope you go home and you serve one another and you love people in your community. And uh, let's all be Jesus to people. Amen. Have an outstanding day, you guys.